Time is 6.06 .06 p.m. Uh, thanks everybody for attending tonight. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of a change to the agenda because we have our, and somebody stole my agenda, oh no, it's here. Uh, because we have our highway department chair who needs to attend. Can you do the remote stuff quickly? I mean, oh, you can do that first, okay. Um, we have one of our select board members who's geographically indisposed. Um, so, uh, you're welcome, Joyce. Um, so I have these steps here um, to to uh, allow remote participation, um, and also to, so we're going to establish a quorum. Um, Joyce Palmer Fortune is participating remotely, and she is not available to attend in person due to geographic distance. Uh, and such remote participation is authorized under 940 CMR 29.10. Uh, and all votes of the board will be required to be roll call. So I actually have to have a more formal um, chair uh, role than I ordinarily do and sound like I am self-important, which I'm not. Um, yes. But so there will be roll call for every vote. Joyce, can you, can you say hello so to see if everybody can hear you? Uh, hello. Can everybody hear? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, people with thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so we're going to move the agenda around just a little bit. Um, Keith. Yes. Barbara. There, there you are. <clears throat> um, I, Brian has in front of him. I just can quickly tell you what I need to have done is two chapter 90 project request. Um, one of them is the portion of Long Plain Road from 116 to the Deerfield Town Line. Um, going down the ramp by the cemetery. Um, that little section is um, in dire need of pavement um, to be repaved and I'm gonna be doing it in conjunction which will end up saving us money. The fact that Deerfield is doing work right adjoining, they're primarily the ones that are getting the um, getting a better price for me because they're doing such amount of, I'm basically piggybacking on that little bit in Waitley. So again, it's a little section from 116 down to the town line, which is our responsibility. It's in Waitley. So that's about $12,000 for that. And the other project request I have is for um, blacktop work on Chestnut Plain Road and North Street portions of North Street from, um, I refer to it as Baldwin's Bridge, but the bridge that crosses Roaring Brook Road from that point going south, there'll be places where we'll be leveling and filling in ruts and reshaping the profile. And then also similar things that will happen on Chestnut Plain Road, south of the Waitley and down towards the Hatfield Town Line. And that is about 65,000. So those two projects are two projects that we'll be doing this summer. Okay. okay. All right. And that's all I have. Minutes from June 27, 2018. Make motion to approve yeah. minutes. Second. All in favor? Roll call vote. Roll call vote. Aye. Aye. Uh, Joyce says aye. Brett says aye. Jonathan aye. says aye. <coughs> okay. 
Um, before we open the public hearing, any comments from the public not about the public hearing? Anything at all? No? Okay. Okay, we are going to open a public hearing. Uh, the hearing uh, is opening at 6.10 p.m. to consider a request from Waitley Investments LLC for a variance from Chapter 62, Section A of the Waitley General Bylaws for 226 State Road in Waitley, Massachusetts. Uh, per a public hearing, um, should we read the variance request, Brian? Um, you can, sure. Sure, why don't we do that as long as I can. Is it in here? No. Yeah, uh, I think it is. It's right after the section three. Right after the. Okay. Um, I won't read the entire letter from Attorney Lesser, but I will read the variance request. The variance from the specific rules and regulations may be. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, variance is requested under Chapter 62, Section 19. A variance from the specific rules and regulations, and this is Chapter 62, Section 19, a variance from the specific rules and regulations may be granted any owner, performer, grantee of a licensee pursuant to MGL Chapter 138, Section 12, or other affected person at the discretion of the Whitley Board of Selectmen acting as a licensing board. The applicant must show that the public safety and order will be maintained and that the police protection of the town of Whitley will be preserved in the event that such a variance is granted. Um, Attorney Lesser cites that he has spoken with our chief of police, uh, Jim Savini, about this about this variance request. Um, according to the letter, Chief Savini has indicated that, uh, in his opinion, public order could be maintained by an employee of the club, provided the employee was approved by the chief, and the employee's responsibility was was actually security at the establishment. Uh, he. Again, this is according to Attorney Lesser, and I'm not doubting you when I say that. I just want to make sure that we know that this is just from the letter. Um, Chief Savini has indicated that the Whitley Police Department does not have the personnel to provide a police officer on the premises at the times that entertainment will be provided. Uh, and for these two reasons, the grant of a waiver would further the goal of ensuring that the police protection of the town of Whitley will be preserved in the event such a variance is granted. Um, so the more specifically, Whitley Investments requests that a waiver be granted under Chapter 62, Section 19 from the provisions of Chapter 62, Section 8, provided the Whitley Investments LLC has an employee approved by the Whitley Chief of Police at all times when entertainment is offered, his responsibility will be to provide security to the establishment. Um, and I want to keep in mind, uh, again, this is a, a waiver, requ waiver request, not a zone bylaw issue. Um, I'll ask Chief first, do you agree with what was stated in that letter? Um, Are those your words? Some of them, yes. Okay. Um, Do you want to expand? Additionally, I'd like to uh, point out, as far as the um, having somebody there that's at the establishment that's approved by me, there's also been just some discussion about a security plan, a written security plan that would have to be discuss, sit down, discuss, and evaluated and signed off uh, by me as well. So that's a little bit of an expansion on that. Um, but as far as having an employee there, I've stated in the past as far as having a trained professional security person on site um, at all times where they're going to be providing entertainment um, would be, from my perspective, my professional opinion, a reasonable um, alternative, if you will, to having a police detail officer there for 13 hours per day. Um, the second part, remember exactly what the. Oh, the Waitley Police Department personnel. Um, as everybody knows, we are we are a small department, so to provide services 13 hours a day with our staff would be difficult, uh, if not impossible. But we would probably have to reach out to other departments, which we discussed at the last meeting, I believe. Um, so it might not be, if if they had to have a police officer on site, it might not be a Waitley police officer, it could be a police officer from any of the number of surrounding towns, local or maybe not so local towns, to be able to, to fill that, um, that requirement. 
So those are the only two things to clarify on, on that. Um, by way of reminder, I want to remind people that this is a discussion about the request for variance. It is not an opportunity to rehash the transfer of licenses that we discussed two, two Wednesdays ago. Um, that, that issue was resolved and, and there's, no, there's no germaneness to rehashing those issues. This is about um, a discussion around whether the variance would hinder public safety and health uh, in the town of Whaley. Um, I want to say, I'm going to open it up to public comment, um, but I also want to make sure everyone understands that we have received probably in the ballpark of 10 emails from Whateley residents over the course of the past 48 hours, um, all encouraging that we deny this variance. Um, and they have done so quite with, with conviction, let's say. Um, and I just want to put that on record that there is a lot of sentiment in town that <coughs> this variance be denied because they can't be here and it's a matter of public record. So I just want to make sure that their voices are heard, that um, the, the sentiment in town is that this variance should be, should be denied. Um, Jonathan, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never saw any emails. Well, what you're referring to, I don't know. Your Whitley.org email account has all of these emails in them. Is that true? Have you seen them, Brian? I, I've got about 10. I think 10 is about okay. the right number. Um, when, they came through the Whitley.org email for the most part, but I think one of them came uh, attached from Brian because it was um, delivered hard copy to him. And when were these put in the Whitley.org? Sorry, oh, uh, 4 30 today? Within the or? last week. Within the last week. Within the last week, roughly. Within the last 48 hours, probably most of them. Well, well many, yeah, many, but I think they were, uh, I was responding to people more than yeah. two days ago. Yeah. So. Okay, maybe I missed it. I, I don't remember seeing them on our website. But. No, not on the website, on, your, on, your, on your, the email yeah. that you have. Yeah. Um, your Whitley email account. So I, again, okay. just a matter of public record. Um, so I will open it up to public comment for anyone who wants to talk about the variance, but again, it's not to rehash the transfer of either the liquor or adult entertainment license. It is the, the conversation needs to be kept to the issue around the preservation of public safety and public health in the town relative to whether we grant a variance about a police detail being required during hours when there are entertainers working at the club. Joe. Uh, Joe Actually, Joe, you better say who you are and all that. Joe Zawinski, 59 Christian Lane. Um, so are you, would the town select board be looking at abolishing this requirement going forward? I, I, I think all the options are open in terms of granting the variance, not granting the variance. And so what would be the purpose of continuing on? But the town voted for this, right? And so if we're going to just flush it for people coming in, then why would you have it at all? Well, the, the, the bylaw, it also states that the select board can, we're not, making, we're not, we're not suddenly deciding that we have the right or not the right to grant variance. Part of the bylaw that was passed back in whatever year it was states that the select board has the opportunity and the, and the choice. So you do have the right to grant. Except we have the right. To right, but but the, but in the bylaw that was passed, it said you we have the right to grant a variance um, if if the person requesting the variance can prove that the that the waiver of the variance. Um, would not impede public health and safety. I don't know where that's been proved. I mean, this, these people have, have opened business, have run a business there, which has been great. Now you have new owners coming in. Where's their track record? And, and that's one of the things that we have to talk about tonight. Okay. Um, I, I will. I will say that, and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with him, but our chief of police has has said that. He, does, he feels that waiving the variance, that I'm waiving, that granting the variance would 
not impede public health and safety. I, I'm just giving you the, the what's yeah, on the record. And I don't, I don't, you know, he has an opinion too. Right. And the, the, you know, but we should look at the chief of police as having a, a more, you know, he, he's throwing it out there that he doesn't have an issue with it, but he doesn't know these guys any more than I do. You're right. So I, I feel that that is a little irresponsible for him to say that he doesn't have an issue with it when he doesn't know these people. He knows these people. He doesn't know these people. Okay. So he hasn't even seen the plan yet, the security plan that they're talking about when he's coming out and saying that he doesn't have a problem with it. You're right. And so how much weight should we really put in what he has to say? I, I guess we should add, he's, he has said that he's talked to the new owners and to people that they are going to employ for security, which is more than I guess any of us in, the, in this room have done. Jim, could you explain more on that? What did you actually do to come up with your decision? Well, the, the decision, and I never, I never made a decision that said I don't, I don't think we need this. I just said I don't think it's unreasonable to have private security that's on site full time, with additional things that we've discussed with as far as security measures go, which would be part of the plan as far as cameras or metal detectors or anything else that may be part of the plan. We haven't opened up those discussions to sit down and develop a plan. I don't know if they have a plan. I haven't seen a plan. And basing my, my statement about um, it being reasonable to allow private security in there, it's, it's not in the sense that <clears throat> I don't think that there's going to be a public safety risk. I can't predict that. I can't say that there's gonna be a risk, but there isn't. I can definitely say that we don't know. We don't know the track record. We don't know their history. We don't know what they're gonna come in and do. So I think there should definitely be some, some things that are considered, some things that we look at as to how we can manage that a little bit better, whether it's you know, regular meetings, whether it's you know granting some other stipulation in the variance, I'm not sure, but that's not a, that's not up to me. What, what's up to me is to make sure that the security <coughs> is provided to the, the level that's not going to raise any, any public safety concerns to the town. And if it does, if something does come up, I mean, the, the board reserves the right to take any action on the, on the license after something might happen. On a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. So we, are we putting the, court, uh, the, the cart before the horse here then? We're asking the select board to make a decision and you're saying that you want to review at some point a security policy. Well, I, no, that's that's the fact. I, I mean, he said it here that we're going to have to review this before he supports it. Yeah. But yeah, so why are we putting any weight into what he's saying right now? Well, if, if you let the process move forward a little bit, well, Joe, I haven't come up with a decision on this yet. I, I haven't said that you have. What's that? I haven't said that you have. I know, but I, I worry you're shaking your head at me as I'm trying to say something. Because we're talking about the process. The process is out of order. That's my point, is that the process is out of order. That should have been established. If that's what is being required, and I've heard it time and time again, that that's what's being required is a security plan, then why don't we have the security plan and have that them sit down with the chief and have the chief sign off and say, I'm good with this. Why hasn't that happened? Well, because I, I think there is, there is a condition in one of these approvals, the license, isn't it? Ryan, correct me, is it 90 days or something to come up with that plan? 30 days, whatever, for that plan for, for Jim to review. So it's already been approved. I'm, I'm talking about this, about this meeting right here, Fred. Yeah, I, mean, I guess that's an option. We can delay this for 30 days. And there you go. Right. Okay. Hey there guys, you go. guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Jim has to say. I, you know what? I guarantee I'm not going to let this hearing continue if we're going to yell at each other. I, I promise you that. That goes for everybody. I, I promise. And if that makes me sound bad, that's the way it goes. But we are not going to yell at each other. Okay, so we're, we're really, I, I guess there's two ways of looking at, three ways of looking at this. One is to have full time police there. The, the second is is the establishment have their own police or the third is somewhere in between. And I think Jim has given us some some input on why he, in his opinion, doesn't think or recommend full-time police there because of the various reasons uh, that are going to impact the, the safety of the town. Uh, so 
I, I guess we're down to. Yeah. Jump in here. Yeah, I was going to just give you that opportunity, Joyce. We're, we're down to somewhere um, in between. Yeah. What what I recall Jim saying at the meeting was more to the effect of, for your ordinary, you know, run of the mill day, that a police detail would not be necessary, and that a private security could handle that. I don't think Jim closed the door on having police details there at all. I agree with uh, that. No. no. And, and, and that's, that's my recollection of what Jim was saying. I know the part where he said the police detail is not necessary has been repeated over and over and over and over again, but people tend to leave off the sentence that came right after that, which was for your ordinary run-of-the-mill day-to-day sort of thing. And I just wanted to bring that up because it's, it really needs to be a part of the record. Um, and we can't really let you know somebody else determine what the police chief says. What, what he says is what he says, and we've got it on tape. So that's, I just wanted to make sure that that got out there as well. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. I agree with that 100%. Don? Well, thank you, thank you. The, the police chief said if there is an, uh, an, an out-of-the-ordinary event, when you expect a crowd that's <coughs> capacity or in excess of capacity, he would recommend a police officer. If Stormy Daniels was coming, obviously we would have a police officer there. But if we're not having some special event with some nationally known person, then we talked about this being sufficient. Let me go over the history a little bit, okay? I think it's important, and I want to make a record of this. Okay. Yeah. Joyce, then, can you hear? Joyce, can you hear? I can hear, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this land has been op operated for over 30 years. And the Board of Selectmen in 1982 passed this variance or this rules and regulations for adult establishments, which I'd like to be entered into the record, as this goes further. And that was 1982, and that was 35 years ago. And it's never been required that there be a police detail there in those 35 years. And during the past 16, 15 years, 16 years, I'd like to enter this into the record, we know that there were 16 calls to the police one a year for a criminal matter. And the chief couldn't say whether or not they resulted in any arrests or how many arrests. However, that's the document. I think everybody. has one or should have one. It's now part of the record. You'd like one to have it. No, I have Okay. Okay, so there's been no dedicated security there during those 16 years. And there's been virtually no incidents in terms of requirements <coughs> of the police. And There's been no enforcement of the rules and regulations which talk about a Waverly police officer being <coughs> on duty. So the only thing that's different about this is we've requested a transfer or we've requested a waiver. We've gotten a transfer of the liquor license, we've gotten a transfer of the adult entertainment license. And your waiver statute says that the waiver shall be granted if the public safety and order will be maintained and the police protection of the town will be preserved in the event such a variance is granted. And it's impossible for me to understand how somebody can make a finding that the public safety and order will not be maintained when the club is gonna be managed by people who have held liquor licenses in the, in the city of Boston 
for the past 20 years. The principal, Mr. Sokol, is closing on four additional licenses today. And he's been approved by the ABCC. There haven't been incidents at his clubs. And I understand that he hasn't done adult entertainment, but there's nothing that's special about security and adult entertainment. If this really got litigated, let me tell you that your bylaw probably would not hold up because it singles out adult entertainment and you're not able to single out First Amendment protected activity. I'm very familiar with every study that's ever been done on this. There are no studies which show increased crime adult entertainment establishment in contrast to a bar or any other establishment where, like that. There just aren't those studies. They don't exist. <coughs> and there's nothing special about this as proved by a track record of 16 years. Now, we have here today uh, Mark DeGiacomi, who was chief of police for Shelburne for the past 20, for 26 years. Before that, he was police administrator for Charlemont for nine years. He's now retired. He's talked to your chief. He's the one who's going to train the people who are going to be working there. And we have indicated we're going to have cameras outside which are available to be reviewed at any time by the chief. We have, cam we have cameras inside the premises too. So the security at that place, which has had no incidents for 15 years or one a year for 15 years, is going to have increased security. It's going to have cameras outside which didn't exist. It's going to have cameras inside which didn't exist. It's going to have one person who's dedicated to the security, which wasn't there before. The security is going to be enhanced compared to what was there before. Significantly <coughs> enhanced to what was there before. And what we talked about before at the last meeting was within 30 days, there would be a written security plan and the, the waiver would be contingent upon, and the license would be contingent upon that approval of the written security plan. In ongoing basis, it would be contingent upon approval of the particular person, the security person, who's working there by your chief of police. There was talk about granting the waiver and having a review in, in six months or four months. There was, and there was, and we agreed that our security, chief of security, uh, Mr. Jim, Mr. Mark, Mr. Giacomo would, would meet with your chief regularly. And I think we even talked about it being on a monthly basis. I think the chief suggested a monthly basis. And we're totally agreeable to that. We're totally agreeable to the monthly meetings were totally agreeable to approval of that person whoever works there by the chief of police we don't have some news approved we can't operate we're agreeable to the cameras outside you're agreeable to the cameras inside um, we're, we're presenting a much more robust robust security plan that exists there presently so what would you rather have would you rather have it, it continued on the present ownership some sort of management <coughs> and no security? I mean, I guess that's an option. We can continue indefinitely in the present ownership, but we're going to give you much more than that. And these people are reputable business people with, a, with an unblemished record in Boston. Well, first of all, I don't think that anyone's questioned their reputation. All people have said is that they don't have a track record in adult entertainment, which is very different than track than than, than questioning their reputation. So I, I, I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Nobody up here has questioned their reputation. That, that's fair, and I appreciate that. All uh, I'm saying is that the running an establishment where there's alcohol served 
it doesn't matter whether it's adult entertainment or not adept adult entertainment in terms of the security requirements. Um, I, I also would just say a couple quick things as, as, as sort of amendments to what, what you said, or, or clarifications is the better word. Um, the one piece of information we don't have, and I'm not pretending that it's this voluminous number, but we don't have the number of state police calls that may or may not have been made um, to come to the castaways over that period of time. We, it's, just, it's just not information that we have, and, I, and I, so, so we, that's an unknown. The other piece is that I, I continually hear about special events and what happens during those times for special events as people approach capacity. Let's stop using the rhetoric that there can be in excess of capacity. There is not going to be in excess of 90 people in that place ever. That is a 95? 95, I apologize. It, it, it's just not in the fire code. It's not allowed. So when the, we talk about special events, it's the special events might bump up against 90, 95, but it's not going to go over 95. The other thing that, that I keep thinking about is regardless of special events, they are going to have increased traffic there. The goal of any business is to maximize the number of people that go into your establishment on a daily basis. If it's not your goal, you're in the wrong business. And and, and not having run an adult entertainment establishment, I do think is germane. But regardless of whether it is a special event, regardless of whether, to Attorney Lester's um, example, Stormy Daniels comes to town, or maybe they book The Who, you still can't have 90 people, and there still obviously needs to be a police presence. But that can happen on at any time, and the goal of, of these gentlemen, because they're smart business people, is to maximize traffic in and out of that place, not to exceed 95 people at any given time. But to do that, there are a number <coughs> of things that we need to think about. If you're down in Springfield and you have a line out the door, you have sidewalks, you have infrastructure in place where those people can line up. <coughs> if you have a crowd that is, is, is resulting in lines out the door because you have hit your seating capacity, your building capacity. We've all been on the corner of 510 and Christian Lane. Where are they gonna go? So, and I'm not saying that's a reason to or not to, to, uh, to, to pr provide this, this waiver, but to say that we can't, we shouldn't think about these things is ludicrous in my mind because it is the corner of five and ten and Christian Lane and Whaley. It is not downtown Springfield. It is not downtown South Highland with the infrastructure in place to handle those kinds of crowds. So I, I think we need to look through this a little bit more. And I know that, and and, and I think you 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 said this. There won't be a waiver until the the plan is vetted by Chief, be, because we'd be crazy to. So. We need to figure out what works here. And I don't want to speak for my colleagues, and I have some thoughts that I'm percolating here, and I'll get to those, but is there anybody else who wants to say anything before I ask Joyce to chime in? Before, I, before that, I'd like to present your memorandum, which has the facts in it. Which facts are those? Facts that I just recited. Okay. Which I think are the facts. Okay. I saw a hand go up. Sir. Thank you. My name is Attorney Brian O'Toole. Uh, Attorney Ed Ryan, who's usually here representing the Constantopolises, unfortunately was uh, suddenly hospitalized and was asked me to come in instead, but he did dictate a letter to me that I'd be more than happy to submit as part of the record, and I do have copies, which essentially mimics what Attorney Lesser has said in terms of the historical background um, of the um, Castaway Lounge under the operation of uh, Mr. Constantopoulos. Um, the, the, the financial hardships that 
if that bylaw in particular were enforced on a 12 to 13 hour uh, basis, again, I won't rehash all that. Um, but that the lack of reported incidents uh, throughout the ownership of the Costatopolises and what we would expect from the uh, new ownership would be, um, it sounds to be more robust uh, and technologically advanced than what the Constantopolises would be at this stage, be able to uh, perform would certainly um, further the goal of what section 62, or chapter 62, section eight um, envisioned, I would imagine, when it was passed back in 1983. Um, so I do have that letter here, and it's um, basically um, in support of Attorney Lester's client's um, proposition here for a waiver um, or some sort of variance uh, with conditions that I'm sure that Attorney Lester's uh, clients and the chief would be um, discussing on a regular basis, even after the waiver slash variance would be granted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to, to point out, as far as looking at the, the past history, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why we had discussed and the idea came up about providing security, having security there, because we don't know what the future is going to bring for this establishment. So to have something more than what's there now is kind of the goal of it. So it, not saying that because we haven't had any issues there, we shouldn't have anybody. No, nope, I don't think anybody's saying that, and I'm certainly not saying that. I think that's why the, the option of full-time professional security being there, because we don't know what, what the future is going to be. We don't know where this is going to turn. And I think you're know, looking at some of the other, the other options as far as the security plan goes or as, as far as any other you know, variances or things that you might add to the variance about adding you know, a detail for a special event, whatever that might be, whether it's you know, whether you pick a, a number for capacity or whether you pick a, a special event or whatever it is, I think having that working relationship so we know when things are going to happen, so <clears throat> we can plan for it and provide a provide a detail if if need be or if we determine that there should be one there. So I just wanted to clarify that it's that's the whole reason that the security aspect of it came up, improving the security with the cameras and and the possibility of metal detectors and other things that we might come up with in that 30-day window to plan to, to discuss what other options we could look at with input from the select board, input from me, looking at it and saying, well, what, what do we want to have in this security plan? And coming up with the comprehensive plan because we can't predict what's gonna happen in the future. So we try to cover it with the, with the plan. So that's what gives us that, that 30 days to work that out before any of this would even happen, before the, the variants would even go into to play. So I just wanted to clarify that. Hopefully it didn't confuse it even more. So Shelly <laughs> Lewinsky, 59 Christian Lane. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased, I guess I'm gonna say, that there is common ground, which is that we are all, I think, of the same opinion. The new owners potentially as well. They're, you know, they are introducing the fact that they understand additional security is probably going to be required. The piece that I'm not really understanding is why they have not been able to bring that forth to us in advance. So to be able to present how many people are going to be trained. So tonight we have a gentleman who's here that, you know, perhaps could be a trainer for who their security force is going to be. Uh, who are those security <coughs> people? Maybe they're not hired, but how many are there going to be? Is it just this one person? Is there a fleet of 10 to cover the amount of hours? These are the details that I think are very important. And I think it's really telling to me that they understand they need additional security. It speaks to what type of environment may be coming. And that's the thing that I keep thinking about in my head. They know there has to be additional security, not just because we asked for it, but because they realize that it's required. And that has me concerned that we don't have a lot of definition for what is their plan to provide it. I'm not sure why that's so difficult to come up with and why that's so difficult to have to be able to present to folks so that we can make an informed and educated decision. And so again, it's a change in ownership. It's not the same ownership. 
there are changes coming. What is anticipated? These are businessmen who should have a plan. They're not buying a business, hopefully, without a plan. Can we please have some more details around what is planned? If those could be presented and they're satisfactory and we have approval and we have definition about what constitutes a special event, you know, above and beyond, hey, there's typically 20 cars. If we get to 30, you hit the button and we say we need more. What it, how do we define it? It's very nebulous at this point, very uncertain. But the common ground is, they agree. They're gonna need extra security. That's a change. We've been requested to provide security. In <clears throat> question of the waiver was brought up, we requested the variance. We voluntarily said, because issues were raised <coughs> by the board, we'd have cameras. We're going to, and the chief will, I'd like the chief to talk a little bit because he's going to train people. There's going to be someone there at the door at all times who is security. He's going to be scanning the ID of everybody who comes into the police so that there's a record of everybody who comes in. The person who's the security person will be going outside and making sure that nothing untoward is happening outside. There will be cameras inside also. And that's the security plan. And we're happy to have, just as you, John, sent us out to talk to the neighbors at a previous meeting, we're happy to sit down with the chief and with Chief DiGiacomo and, uh, and someone from the board or Brian from representing the board and work out a nuts and bolts line by line security plan. How many cameras there's gonna be? There's gonna be a camera, for example, in that smoking area. It's gonna be a 360 degree camera that's gonna come down and get the entire smoking area. So we have, we have a plan it's a question of just sitting down with the chief and putting it in writing. Right, and, and, and I think I think she would probably agree with that. Just so this is lovely to have it as a right. conversation, and now it's recorded. So, but why can it not be put on a document? So yes. as we walk into the meeting, we can look at a document that says they have agreed to X, Y, Z because they believe this is what's going to be required. Does it meet what we would expect? Does it, you know, uh, is it a um, like for what having a police officer for which we don't have a budget would it would it meet the same criteria etc I'm not sure why it's difficult to put that in writing instead of having it as a conversation and put the burden on me to decide what's required I, I don't feel that that's my responsibility it's the business owners responsibility to have a plan that can be presented in writing and not discussed at a meeting on the spot off the cuff we just assumed that the variance the way the variance would be granted subject to coming up with a security plan with the chief if it didn't come up with a, with a security plan that met the chief's needs uh, we wouldn't have a variance but if you no, want this might to, be a good time for me to chime in john but yeah. but, but if you want it can i finish my yeah hold on just one second but but mm -hmm. if, if hold on one second Joyce. but it, but if you want us to sit down with the chief at this point and do it in the next two weeks and come back two weeks from now we can do that too but 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 we, we were asked to bring chief to giacomo here yep and he's here and i'd like to hear from him but i'm going to hear from joyce no first requested that he speak yet yeah no i i well but we've asked for public comment and and trust me he's on my radar uh, joyce go ahead Okay, one of my comments goes kind of way back. I think um, uh, the attorney Lesser might have misread something on the variance um, reading from 6219. It does not say that the variance shall be granted. It says the variance may be granted. 
Um, it also says the applicant must show that the public safety and order will be maintained. So I just wanted to make that really clear. I know the law regarding the granting of the license says that you shall grant the license, but the variance does not say the word shall. And the difference between shall and may is really important. And I just wanted to bring that up. And given the context of you know people worried about the security, that might be a way for the applicant to show that the public safety and order will be maintained, or insofar as anyone can show that in advance. Um, it, you know, I, I, I just wanted to, to bring that up. It is not that the variance is assumed to be granted. Um, it's that the applicant must show, and then it may be granted. That's the way the, the variance section reads. Um, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's relevant to the discussion of the security plan. I, uh, thank, you. thank you, Joyce. Well, before you begin, um, I say I agree with totally agree with Joyce. Okay. Um, at the same time, you can't refuse to grant a variance unless there is a, a, re a reasonable evidentiary record. And I'd like to say that you received emails, and we're not privy to those emails, and as far as I'm concerned, they're not part of the record. They're not to be considered. The only thing that's to be considered are people who come and speak <coughs> at meetings. And I think the case law is quite clear on that. I've never been given copies of them, and it would be a violation of due process, so I wanted to put that on the record. Well, they are public records, so you're more than welcome to them. They were sent to public email accounts, and they are part of public record. Okay, but I don't believe that they're evident, and you've talked to counsel about this. I don't believe that they are things that you are allowed to consider in terms of this hearing. So you wanted to talk to the chief, though? So I, I do, chief. but I... I I'm, I'm going to say, I didn't say that I was considering them. I said that they are part of the public sentiment that is out there, and it is my responsibility to make sure that people in this town are heard, even if they cannot attend a meeting. I'm not saying that I take it into consideration or not. I'm just saying that I believe that people's viewpoints should be heard. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> Chief. I'm saying that they should be heard if they have something that's relevant to the issue that's before us, the issue of public safety. If they have a comment that's relevant to that issue and you want to bring it up, that's fine. But people, who, this is not a popularity contest. The First You're Amendment right. has never been a popularity contest. If it were a popularity contest, we would lose. Okay, you would not have granted us an adult entertainment license to begin with. Okay, it doesn't have anything to do with how many people are in favor of it, how many people are opposed. It only has to do with whether or not there's evidence in the record which shows that we've been unable to prove that the public safety and order will not be maintained according to our plan. Okay. Chief. Good evening. I'm Mark DiGiacomi. I was the Chief of Shelburne for 27 years, and during that time I was also the Chief of Chalamont for nine years. Um, after that, I was the Director of Public Safety and Security at the Holyoke Mall. Um, there we had uh, 20 million people visit us each year, and my, my job was to secure and maintain the security of both the uh, employees, the visitors, and the stores. Um, I have met with Chief Savini. Um, I have no problem working with him on developing a plan. Uh, I've talked to him about uh, placing cameras outside, that there are none there right now. I, I believe there's one that is not very well placed, but um, <clears throat> placing cameras outside that I don't have a problem giving access to the Waverly Police Department uh, uh, current access. I mean, uh, anytime they want to see them, they can have it in their station with blueprint, uh, with Bluetooth or whatever is needed to uh, observe those cameras. Inside's a little different, only because um, I think there might be some privacy concerns. However, I don't have any problem with the way the police department uh, obtaining, uh, coming to us and, and reviewing our tapes or any type of investigation they want to do. Um, right now, the place has no security whatsoever. Um, we plan on putting at least one officer, one, one security officer at the door, as uh, Attorney Lesser said, we want to use scanners to um, scan IDs to make sure the 
obviously the age uh, is a proper age to get in there. No underage people would be allowed. Um, that we would have a record of those um, people entering the establishment. Um, in addition, I believe that they wanted, uh, that you want to put a uh, eight foot concrete area outside there where the, where the uh, current pl employees smoke. I want to, as Tom, uh, Attorney Lester said, put a 360 camera in there that um, would be monitored uh, all the time. That's for the safety of everybody. And, um, where it's a concrete barrier, I, I don't want anything to happen in there. Um, uh, unauthorized personnel getting in there or anything. This is for the safety of the employees and the safety of the public. We don't have any problems putting cameras up. More cameras outside to uh, look at the parking lot and sharing that with the way the police department. Uh, our goal is to, to have a safe and secure <coughs> entertainment destination for people to come. We do not, we, we talk about special events. Um, we're limited to 95 people, that's, that's fire code, I understand that. Um, if for some reason we had an event that we anticipated more people than uh, are normally there, I don't think we have a problem working with the Waverly Police to hire an officer during that time to ensure extra safety along with our own personnel. During the course of my uh, time as police chief, I was an instructor for the Massachusetts Criminal Justice Training Council for many classes, different types of classes. I also was the, uh, had to do the instruction for all these security officers at the Holyoke Mall. Uh, we employed over 40 officers there at one time, um, and they all had to be trained. I would. Is there a special training for security officers for adult entertainment? I don't think so. I don't think there's a, there's a curriculum out there. However, working with Chief Savini, I am confident that we can come up with a security plan that is adequate for the safety of everybody and for the, for the townspeople of Waverly. I worked with the chief before, um, when I was chief, and I, I don't foresee any problems whatsoever. And we're having a, in my opinion, a security system that is currently unexist doesn't exist. You mean current in the current location? In the current location, there is no security. So we're only expanding that as if we're gonna have at least one person on, maybe more depending on depending on what's going on. Uh, and those officers will be trained. I'm hopefully gonna uh, hire ex police officers, but I can't guarantee that because I don't know who's gonna apply. Um, we haven't hired anybody yet because we don't have the license. So we can't guarantee anybody any employment. But those purposes will people will be trained by myself and through the chief and the Whitney Police Department <coughs> to ensure that we meet the requirements of the town. Okay. Like I said, the chief, uh, in re response to a, a comment Jonathan made that after all <coughs> uh, that state police, if state police comes to any event in town, whether it's there or anywhere in town, are you notified when you're in town? And if you aren't or aren't under what conditions do they notify you if there's, if there's a murder if there's a, a fender bender are you notified what what conditions do they notify you because i've i've heard from various people in town that state police are here and that our administ either administration here or our police are aware of these significant events <coughs> that the police are here for and i'd like to know is, is that true or not Currently, yes, it is. Uh, any call that comes in, a 911 call or any emergency call that would come in, would go through our dispatch center and it would get forwarded to the state police barracks. Um, in order for it to get forwarded to the state police barracks, a call is generated, which I have access to with our record management system. So um, if something happened, for example, if something happened at 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, I might not know about it if, it, if it's not a, a murder or a major event like that if it's uh, if there was an arrest for a disturbance or something like that um, i might not know about that till monday morning when i check the daily log or the, the logs for the for the weekend um, so we do have access to just that log entry if i needed to get an actual copy of the police report i would have to talk with the officer you know the, the investigating officer to, to get you know more details as far as the, the case would go but i would be made aware through our uh, through our dispatch system but it's not anything that I have a notification on my cell phone every time state police get called. That's so, that's but, but so if, an incident, if an incident happened at 1 a.m. At, at, at this entertainment place, you would know the next morning when you log in or, or even that evening 
when you log into your system, what happened? Did, would the, the required state police to be there? Yes, that so call would be forwarded to the state police. Right. And then it would go into our CAD or computer aided dispatch system, and I would be be able to see that record. Okay, well, that's different than but, but, saying there's no police but, after your. your but, but Fred, that hasn't always been the case because you Correct. and we, we have sat here in this well, over the past 15, I've been on the work 15 years, so about as long as these records have been in place. And we have had many conversations about how you don't necessarily have that line of communication always with, with the state police. I'm right. thrilled that that's changed, but historically that has not been the case. Correct, right. that's, why I say, that's why I say currently. Right. <laughs> right. Over the last right. few months, so, we have that. Well, don't don't turn my words, Frank. Maybe it's changing, but, but you're always going to miss some or or. Okay. Whatever, but, uh, um, we got to <coughs> figure this out in the back. Principal Lyle, 190 Christian Lane, and yeah, safety is an issue, and that's why that bylaw was originally passed because we had concerns for safety, and now we have a chance to enact it. And I think we need to have the plan, the security plan. I don't think we can possibly even think about accepting, granting the variance without a security plan. Who's paying for this? How much of our, our officers' time is gonna be used doing this? Are they going to, Are we as townspeople not gonna have our services because of this one business absorbing all this time, monitoring the cameras, or reviewing the cameras or the complaints. And where are these complaints going to be kept? There were lots of times that things happened that were kind of off the record. People knew they happened, but they were off the record. I want to be sure, assure now that if something happens there, is going on there, even if it's minor, it's part of a record. This is our town. I've been here for years. Let's keep it up with the standard we have for everything else. And again, how can we possibly look at or accept anything or think about voting anything without having the who's, the what's, the why's, the where of the security plan? Who's paying? What's included? How are they trained? What if those conditions aren't met? What would happen then? We have to have this all laid out in a definite plan. So they're accountable. And we as a town are accountable. I saw another hand. Uh, yeah, uh, Nicole Lankowski, 22 North Street. Um, I just want to suggest that I don't think it would be possible for you, the, for the board, to make a decision tonight if the, every member of the board hasn't had a chance to read the at least 10 emails, I think you said, that came through to the three of you. Um, so unless we want to read them out loud tonight and then they would become public comment or we just table it so that Fred and anyone else who hasn't read the complete 10 or more emails that came through in the last 48 hours, as Joyce said, I don't think it's possible to make an educated decision. I haven't seen the 10. Uh, the I've seen one or two, but they were not on the variance. They were objecting to the licenses. One or two is all I've seen. I haven't seen 10. Okay, well, I know. I so, mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that there are more. And if, I would like to see them, yes. If Joyce is saying that she's read at least 10, <coughs> I don't know why you haven't read at least 10. So I was also counting one that was published in the Gazette, so. Well, I check every day and I didn't see him. I'll go back again. But. Joyce, what do you got? Um, I, you know, I, I'm kind of agreeing with the last few speakers who said it. I mean, it, it, I've read the letters, obviously. I'm not sure that I, clearly Fred hasn't had a chance to see them all. Um, and uh, the other uh, speaker who said, you know, how can we really approve this without at least us seeing the security plan that the police chief is, is signing off on? Um, I don't know if we can 
delay this until that happens. That might just mean the security plan happens faster, um, which might not be a bad thing either. Um, it's, I, I feel like that would be integral to what's written in the bylaw, which is that they should show. I mean, that's, it's not on us to show that it's not. It's on them to show um, that it is, right? I'm pulling, pulling it up here on my screen, so I'm not looking directly at the camera anymore. Uh, the applicant must show that the public safety and order will be maintained and that the police protection of the town of Waitley will be preserved in the event that the variance is granted. So it's not on us to guess, it's on them to show, and they, I, you know, they're, they're, they're describing much better security than it exists there now. I, I, I would have to agree with that statement. Um, but it's, you know, it, I think there's, for those reasons, I think it is hard to decide on this uh, right now. Okay, well, I, 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 I agree. I, I think what has been verbally laid out is, you know, it sounds great, but I, I know I wouldn't grant, I, I wouldn't grant a waiver of, of the bylaw without, without having it in writing. And it just, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I've, I've been forming some opinions here and, and I've, you know, I'm still not sure how we fall on this, but I, I think the first step, for my opinion, is, you know, and I hope you guys understand and agree that uh, how can we, the verbal explanation of what you guys would do with your with your security plan, sounds wonderful, but I, I think having it in writing, having it part of the public record, as Attorney Lesser correctly points out, we need to put everything that's germane as part of the public record. Um, <coughs> We need to we need to wait for that. I don't know how quickly you guys can craft something um, that the chief has taken a look at. Um, I know that I personally would want to see it and hear his thoughts in enough in a long enough period in a sufficient period of time where I could digest it rather than having to digest it 24 hours before this meeting I don't know what the process would be or if there is a process or needs to be a process for it, it to be out in the public domain I, I don't know how that works Brian or our council but mr. chair this would <coughs> be required to be a public domain document and there may be some reasons with respect to security particulars that both the applicant and the police department may not want it to be public, but I would defer to the chief and then the particulars that are presented as to what would be appropriate to provide in advance beyond what would be presented here and what would be given to the chief. So we could, if we had sufficient time to digest it as a board, after the chief's taken a look at it, we could talk about sort of holistically what it looks like, the, 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 the 30,000 foot level for public consumption. But any, but, but, Whaley LLC would have the opportunity to say, I don't want that piece aired in public because of security concerns. And that would be subject to, in my view, the view of the chief of police as well. Okay. Just an assertion would not necessarily, without having seen what the particular yep. is, mean that it couldn't be disclosed. Yeah. Good. Uh, two comments on, kind of on, on dates we're dealing with. Well, if, if we don't decide today, our next meeting is in two weeks, and we've also heard we got the 30 days to come up with a plan uh, with the chief. When does the 30 days start or, or end? The 30 days runs from the issuance of the license itself, the entertainment license. Of the, the issuance, which was, what, two weeks ago or something? So are we well, talking to say The license document itself, I don't believe, has issued so is it the license that is what we approved here as a board or what what it, Boston you, approves you, for the, no, the, the entertainment license is local you took a vote and approved but that all needs to be incorporated into a formal document you approved your meeting minutes tonight that included the vote on that license so now a document may be issued and, that, and is in, that would start the clock and that is only in the entertainment license and not the alcohol license that requirement I believe that's correct I'm, I'm going to suggest that 
perhaps wait a little see expedite that process a little bit if they want this to move forward and not wait and not use the 30 day clock you're more than welcome to use the 30 day clock but if you know if you're going to postpone it for two weeks we try to meet with the chief in the next week as soon as it's in the next you know either next monday or tuesday or well you guys can deal with the schedule off right. offline but i would suggest you have sort of a framework in writing for the chief to review and, and then we're going, to be, we're going to meet with the chief and yeah. we'll come up with something and we can discuss with him whether or not because it is security you don't want to tell everybody in the world what your security is in your establishment we'll want to see it obviously we should see that before yeah. the meeting how, how much of that is yeah, revealed and we'd have that to you within a week and you'd have a week to digest it that would be fine are you going to be around yes okay so no more no more on vacation we don't allow that. We don't allow that. No allow. Not before our own days. Exactly. You get a great vacation. I can. I can get, get a meeting with the chief and. Yeah. I mean, you have your 30 days, but if I were you, I would. You know. Well, I just told you what to do. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do it within the week. We'll have something within the week, and we'll come back, and then you'll either you'll do what you're going to do in two weeks. Okay. We can take an action. Hopefully, I mean today. So say we're, we're not taking two. action on this today. No, I mean, we're I, delaying for two weeks. That would be. Do we need to make a motion on that? Yes. Okay. I'm going to continue to a date, time, and place. Sir. I will make a motion that we continue this hearing to uh, Wednesday, July 25th. Thank you. Uh, 6 p.m. here at the Whaley Town offices. Uh, second that motion. Roll, roll call vote. Yeah. Joyce? Uh, aye. I Fred. agree to uh, delay. Yeah. Fred? Okay, Fred, yes. Aye. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Thank you. Capadona, Colonial Power. We apologize for being a few minutes late, but oh, I yeah, actually yeah. would be counting my blessings if I were you that we're not more late. <laughs> not at all. I fully understand it to this for business, so I, I understand when these things go. Not a problem at all. Um, and I don't know um, what you've been prepped with. Um, what I'm here to talk to you tonight about is municipal aggregation. Uh, on the supply side of your electricity bill, kind of the process which um, the town of Whitley is, is beginning to uh, embark on, if you will, uh, through FERCOG, Colonial Power was chosen to, to take communities through the process and, and, and take them, so it's kind of a two-part process. There's a local process and then there's the state process. And after the state process, once we get approved, then there's the, let's go out to bid and find out what kind of energy long-term stable rates, renewable energy, so forth. So what is the local process for municipal aggregation? Simply already happened for you uh, quite some time ago. Took a town uh, vote, you passed it at a uh, town meeting. Now it's simply hang a plan and uh, uh, approve that plan. And then your local process is complete here. After that, we wanted the Department of uh, Energy Resources. There's a quick consultation there that would happen with the administrator after that call it, it's simply onto the department of public utilities there's a couple of um, questions back and forth uh, we call them interrogatories and that process can take a long time six eight months it's a state process that we don't have control over. after that point there'll be other communities we'll all get together make some decisions on what you're looking for from Waitley as far as green renewable local energy whether it's long-term stable rates so forth and so on long time from now it's more about the process right now and what has to happen for the next steps right can i ask a couple questions please shoot um first i just want clarity that i believe we have already been pretty clear about what we are looking for in terms of the mix and aggregation um from and, and again i just want just so that everyone knows 
the energy committee's met on this a few times and we are, are, are very strived in the fact that either it's gonna be cleaner, I like the term clean better than green, yep. cleaner at the same cost or less expensive at no browner a mix. Understood. And, that, and otherwise, I, I know, I'll, I'll speak from, as a member of the energy committee, a member of this board, I would have no interest. So that process happens after you get approved? I get that, yeah, right. But at, we would never start a program, we never have, where you'd be above or there wasn't a benefit to the end user. So that, that's kind of why we got in the business of, of aggregation, is exactly that. Can we do it local, cheaper, longer and stronger, meaning right. you might be able to do a long-term deal. And, and local, and actually thank you, because local is important there. It's, you can get cleaner Texas wind. Might you not know, be I, I'm not sure the benefit to wind in Massachusetts on that, but I get, I've done this for a long time, so I get that climate is climate, but yeah, But uh, No, and from my standpoint, that's why I like aggregation, because you get to make the decision for your town. The second point, and it's, and it's more a point of clarity, but it's been a, a source of frustration on our end a little bit. I understand that Colonial Power has talked about how our vote back in 2000, I believe it was 11, um, when we voted for aggregation with the Hampshire COG yes. program, Colonial Power indicated that that was sufficient. However, we have heard responses from the DPU that that is absolutely not the case and I'm still in the dark unless you have an update for me that I haven't heard. Yeah, DP, DPU in conversations with I believe your attorney has backed off that. But I haven't seen anything in writing. They won't put it in writing. So that's a problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've asked. So, so I, I will tell yeah, you, yeah. I, I wanted to bring you, we've used that exact same language. Uh, Bernardston, Millville, Orange, Upton, Wendell, and West Brookfield all have gone through with the exact same language and approved on our plan. That's why I'm saying I'm not guessing that it'll get approved. I'm 100% positive because it would be some bias towards Waitley. We've already put through uh, six other communities with that exact same language. Oh, the DPU approved it. The DPU approved it. With the exact, okay. the exact same language. Okay. So I'm not guessing at it. I'm telling you we've right. used it and it's been successful. I Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Because obviously, understood. Yeah. It's been a long, arduous process for Whitley. I get that. But I'm, I'm not speaking maybe, theoretically. I have six communities that I've already put through the department and received a, a, a positive order. Gotcha, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I cut you off, I don't know what you were. Well, I, so I, I wanted to say, because I know you guys have a, had had a long night. Tonight, what we're looking for in front of you is simply a contractual obligation so that we can move forward. Once that's done, the administrator could hang the plan, and then after that's been hung for 15 days, you could vote on the plan, and then the local process is complete. My other question, and I apologize, I just thought- No problem. Um, and Joyce, chime in here, if because I know you're pretty close to this as well. My recollection is that at some point your process gives an hour, an hour window to either accept the bid or not accept the, the mixed bid. It's a little long, it's about three hours. Okay, but yeah, that was gonna be my question because yes. again, I, I've been doing this a long time. We're yes. Been the marketing, on the marketing end of this a long time. And an hour was, uh, I, it stopped me in my tracks because Two at a minimum is usually, and again, I think that's outrageously short anyway, too. But I get that energy markets work the way they work. But an hour, really. No, no we, we make them hold their price until around three o'clock so that they can set their hedge. You should have, we ask for pricing at 11, and then by noon, I have it all on a spreadsheet for you so that you can look at it. We have a call, and then we allow you to sit with that. What, ask questions back and forth. The actual process, I'll just explain it. Two weeks beforehand, we ask for what we call indicative pricing or sample pricing of the market of the products you're looking for. You can ask any questions that you're looking for. What does this mean? How does this work? And then two weeks later, a week later, I should say, we have final pricing. So the only thing you're actually looking for at that time is pricing. You already know our process, what you're looking at, how it's uh, formatted, so that at that point, you guys can have an honest conversation about the market and, and what you're thinking on that day. You don't have any questions about what you're looking at. Are they mixed options or is it one option? 
it's, if you say to me, what I'd like to see is, I'd like to see a standard product, I'd like to see a, I'm just gonna use your term, national wind product, I'd like to see a local renewable product, I'd like to see a hydro product. You'll have all of those products and all the suppliers bidding on them for different time frames. Six, 12, 18, 24, 36, 30 months, all of that is there for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. How does this affect uh, NextAmp's efforts underway to get them to sign uh, with you and uh, sign with them and give you a, a credit on the uh, on their credits that they're going to get from the energy company so in the state how does this affect them so it wouldn't have any effect it, it's agnostic to who your supplier is whether it's basic service or the or the town's aggregation so their net median credit is nothing more than a financial transaction with the utility so whether or not you were part of the program or on basic service you would still get that credit what I will say to you is, if your price is below, as we spoke about, we want to be at, at the same or below to, to get the program started and so forth. National, uh, here, excuse me, it's actually Eversource uh, West or ex Wamico, they'll always credit you what their basic service rate is. So if your rate was nine cents for the aggregation and the basic service rate was 10 at the time, they would credit your bill, you'd be paying nine, but they'll be crediting your bill for an extra bonus um, 10. If you sign a contract longer, let's just say, the knife cuts both ways, it's not a free lunch. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's a free lunch. So let's just say you sign that nine cent rate for three years. A, a local renewable product, nine cents flat rate. Uh, 18 months into the contract, the summer rate went to eight and a half cents. Now, uh, Eversource would be crediting your bill eight and a half, and you'd be paying nine. You can always opt out of this program, go back to basic service. But as you can see, the exact same, the situation can flip-flop depending on rates. That's all. It would have no effect on a net metering deal. Zero. You still use the same amount of kilowatts that you used before. It doesn't have any effect on usage. But what would you be buying power from, Nextamp or Colonial? You, uh, well, you'd be buying it from another supplier. And you'll be receiving a, a next amp uh, net metering credit on your right. bill. Right. That's exactly the way it would work. Or if you opted out of the program, you'd be getting basic service plus that uh, next amp. Right. But correct me if I'm wrong. But the, the so I think to answer Fred's question, the actual power is being procured by Colonial. The net metering credits are just energy credits. That's it. Right. right. But because because the the, the 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 juice that's generated by the next amp solar panels is just going into the grid okay. and we're getting energy credits for that we're getting so we're getting price on it not actually buying electricity from next you it's going into the grid it's going into the grid and it's not a, okay. the real issue is is when it's it's wonderful now it's it's taking away some of the peak but when you in the middle of the night when you flip the switch you want to still have power yeah. well that solar field isn't it's no longer uh, uh taking power so it's doing great stuff. It's doing great stuff, don't get me wrong. Hopefully it's got battery storage and a whole right. bit and it's all working. But at this point, it's still not a, a viable option for the end user. Right. Joyce, what do you got? Um, my question was about, um, you know, that, uh, that three hours of pressure, right? Well, that um, kind of, uh, you, you said that uh, you'd be presenting um, like a few different options. And there's many, many towns in the room. Um, does that mean each town gets to just pick one of those options, whichever one they like, or does everybody have to come to agreement on one of those? So, I mean, because it is aggregation, and I understand, you know, the, uh, the, <coughs> the you know it might be based on on the numbers of people there. Um, so, can you say a little bit more about you know what our town's representative would have to decide when they're in that room for three hours, say? So, and, and again, it. it we will use the load of all the people that, so think of it this way, and we will show you that combined pricing and you're going to be surprised. I mean, honestly, you're going to be surprised. So let's just say there's five communities, uh, Waitley and ABCD. All five of those towns will have a combined price and we'll show you all of those options that everyone's looking for. Then we'll show you an individual Waitley price and all of those options. And what I'm going to tell you is, is what we have seen, normally aggregators don't have that kind of transparency, but for us, we want to show that. If you have a great load profile, you will be subsidizing town A, B, C, D. 
If you don't have a good load profile, meaning how you use your energy and when it's used, how much industrial compared to commercial and residential is there, then you'll, you will, you'll be the one getting subsidized. So lots of times when you only see one price, you don't know the difference. It's all for one, one for all. But if I show you, it can be marketably different, your price compared to the whole price. And that's why I think it's important that aggregation show you the difference and how loads actually react different in the marketplace. Now, if, the, if everyone wanted to go together, I would say absolutely, I could just show one price. But when I show everyone their individual price, some people start to say, hey, wait a minute, my, re my residents deserve nine cents, not 9.7 cents. Because that's what my load profile looks like. And now it starts to fall apart. It's one of the reasons why we have intensive prior meetings to make sure that everyone's on the same page. But I can still use the aggregate load, meaning all five communities, yet you choose National Wind, and you choose a, a local hydro product, and he chooses a local solar product. So, but to follow on Joyce's question about the aggregation, and is it all for one or one for all, but that also means that it can break down into two towns and three towns. So I can foresee because of, the, because of your, your load that, and I don't know which of the towns it would be of the five, because it, it I'm could, up, it, I, I, I get it, up. but it could be that four towns look at the fifth town and say, you are out because you're killing us. Correct. Theoretically, that could happen. Theoretically, and not only theoretically, it actually has happened. Right. <laughs> so, hey, listen, I, if they see it in indicative pricing, and they have a conversation, they said, we'd like to go together, we're gonna take this load together, I let the supply community know, and those communities move together. And it's possible, it's not against any contractual relationship no. to design. At all, I mean, that's the power of aggregation, that's why we want you to be in control so that there isn't some, some company out there that says, hey, here's your price. We don't care what you want. But one price. town, one town could be left out in the cold. No but and they may have to just take their aggregated price. Right. That's what they would have to do. What do you mean by low? The consumption, the amount each town consumes, and when they consume it, and right. how they consume it. That's correct. Commercial, residential, industrial. Probably no industrial. And the reason I'm saying that most industrial customers at this point are already out in competitive supply. If okay. their load is is advantageous at all. So it'd be one one rate for all. All users, all and, types of users? But, uh, so you can, lately, most people have gone with a single rate across the board, meaning, hey, we're one community, but some communities, the city of Marlboro has had a commercial, industrial, uh, residential, individual rates. It's allowed. It has to be equitable across the rate class. You can't charge uh, the people on street ABC different than XYZ street. Everyone that's residential has to have the same rate. Everyone commercial has to have the same rate. Everyone industrial has to have the same rate. But everyone can also share in that burden. But you are locked into whatever that load was at that moment in time. So if all of a sudden Western Massachusetts had access, don't I wish, to smart grid, we'd have to wait for that contract to be over to really take advantage of the smart, smart grid load usage. That's correct. Yeah. I would, I wouldn't hold your breath. I would not, I, I would like to. <laughs> I, I, I wish we were that close because then we're gonna really make some difference when it comes to load profile. Right. It's gonna be a completely different, because right now we're looking at a meter read, June 1st, July 1st. When did you use the energy? There's nothing in the data that shows us that. We have a dumb meter and it doesn't show us that. If you're a large G3 user, I have information every 15 minutes being sent back to the utility. What is nice is after you get your aggregation up and running, you will have an hourly load profile because we require that the supplier set up a load asset at the, um, at the ISO. So each hour, all your uh, accounts get put into a load asset ID, and then you'll be able to get some sharper pricing down the road. Okay. So, Joyce, do you have any other questions? Um, that was my main question. It just seems like it's a, it's a process that is, I don't know, psychologically taxing. And I, I, don't I, wanna... really, I don't think in three hours have enough time to make a good decision and it's you're sort of in the, you know, I was, I was at a, a, a store 
and, and I needed to get a new cell phone or I was in the process of trying to figure out if I needed to get a new cell phone. Uh, and, and there it is, this, this one, it's on sale for half price. Get it today. <laughs> the price is gonna be you know, going up. You know, it's, it just feels like pressure sales. And I, 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 don't, I just react badly because of that. But if you, if it is as you say, you know, if Waitley would be better off going alone than everybody else, you know, wanting to do something, that, you, you, that we still have that, uh, the freedom to choose among the options you give us. We don't have to all come to agreement on one option. That does help a bit. And, uh, I, will say, my mind. and I will say, we, we run through the week before. It's a call open. If you want to spend five hours on the call asking questions, ask all the questions you want the week before. That's why we run that indicative pricing seven days prior so that everyone is at ease, all their questions are answered. It's just about what's happened in the marketplace. It doesn't happen often, but it has happened over the last 15. Every once in a while you get a spike up or, up or down. And if that, if that happens, then you're still looking at the pricing, but you already know what you're looking at as far as product is concerned and the differentiating price with that product. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to make a motion that we enter into a contra this contractual relationship with Colonial Power based upon the information we've heard today. Is that an accurate motion, Brian? Yeah, I, I have a couple questions if, if, in terms of the process. Yeah. I, got, I got to back out of the, the details for a second. So. So, so in terms of process with the town, um, the town would sign an agreement um, with Colonial Power, and then what are the next steps after that happens? Oh, I can make this easy, so you don't have to try I to like, memorize. I like easy. <laughs> I don't know how I would do that. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a place? Yeah. Can you read that? <laughs> I don't know if I just leave that here for her. Or I'll send it to um, you in the morning, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah, send it to me in the morning. <laughs> so, which morning? <laughs> Who's morning? Who? What? Wait, we stand a time. <laughs> Joyce is getting a little tired. So of this is <laughs> all the steps that I hear. You've already done step one. We would have the plan for you. After you do one, now you're at. A point where okay you're going to contract with colonial right and then there's development of the plan to review the plan which would be the next step that we're talking about we give you a plan you'd hang the plan for 15 days after the plan has been hung you simply this board would have to approve that plan as hung can i, can I pause for one yes. second there yes absolutely development of a plan so that's an aggregation plan that's correct. That that Colonial Power prepares. Yes. In consultation with the town and DOER. Yes. What's the timing on that? How long does that typically take? I, I so I have a plan. It's not right now. We've done a seventy-five pounds. Yeah. So we have a plan ready to go for you. Yeah. We can send that plan over to you. We know that the call with the DOER is going to be you're in good hands. Here's the situation. They're going to walk through that with you. But we've done this numerous times. Yep. So we already know the plan is is going to get approved. There might be some small tweaks to it. They always make a change. When you give a lawyer a document at the department, they make a change to it, but it's nothing, there's nothing material to that. Of course. Uh, other than that, it's just you voting on that plan. It's the step in the, in the uh, law that requires you. Public review, and that's 15 days the department has said in their regulations, we like that, hung for 15 days. After that, the, the select board vote upon that plan and approve that, this board. Um, and after that, it's done at the local level. You're, that's your heavy lift at this point. Hang the plan and vote on it. And then we go on to the DOER. That's a consultation call. Uh, we just did it on Monday. A, a new person just took it over. It took about 12 minutes. So they know the plan, they know our plan, didn't have any questions, ran through what was in the plan. Don't expect that to take much time. Then we fall into the abyss. And by that I mean, Denise takes the plan, puts it together with all the documentation, and that gets filed with the Department of Public Utilities. That's 1.6 here? That is 1.6. The department 
At that point, 30 days later, once we file all the plan with all the documents, they, they have a, a, a public hearing. It's conveniently located in cell station at their offices. No reason for you to show, Colonial will go. They literally, it takes about three minutes. Anyone speak for, anyone speak against, gavel drops, that, that concludes the hearing. Then they're gonna take their time, they'll ask some questions about your plan. After that, we'll respond to those questions and then you'll get a, a, what I'll call an approval. So th th they, they call it an order. The order states that you're approved and then from Colonial standpoint, the fund starts. We start to discuss at some point what are we looking for for products, what kind of term, those kind of things. That's the unregulated part of things. We make, we make a choice, we go out to the marketplace, find out who has the best price for the right times, and then we start the whole education plan, which is, is, is here. So we, did, we didn't get into that, it's still early for this, but after you made a decision, we want 24 months local um, solar product, um, a fixed rate at uh, 10, 10 cents, nine and a half cents, whatever that rate is. We would then have a, a letter written it has to be approved by the consumer division. Everyone that's on basic service would receive that letter. We'd also have an information session or, or numerous sessions so that anyone could come down and ask questions. Here. Here. We, you tell me here or you know, uh, Council on Aging or wherever it's best. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right here in the local so that everyone has their questions answered. What we try to do is inundate. So we hope that we'll, you'll mention it at your select board meeting. We hope that we get an article in the newspaper and that they, it's, it's, they're receiving the mailing at the same time. So it's hard to get to people's attention. You guys know better than I, uh, because it's difficult when people aren't paying attention. But if it's, on the, if it's in the newspaper, if you see something in the mail, and they see it on the local cable station, it gets people's attention. That's the best way we've found to, to bring people to the table. And we have a, uh, in that, in that uh, newspaper article, on, on the, we'll, we'll say a date and a time that we're gonna have an information session come on down and ask questions, I will be there to answer questions. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And then 30 days after they receive that, if they don't do anything, this is the hot button item that we should mention, it's an opt-out aggregation. If they take that piece of mail and they throw it out, they're going to be uh, enrolled in the program. Opt-out aggregation. But in our plan, it allows for a free opt-out and a free opt-in as many times as they like. So. Say they, they just threw out the mail that they were in the program, automatically got enrolled. Hey, I don't like the idea of that. They give us a call, we opt them out of the program, it's not a problem. Can they go online? They can do it online. It was a simple phone call. Absolutely. But they can sign the card and send it back in. No problem. If they don't want to, you know, they don't have the internet, they want to make a phone call, it's private to them, it's in an envelope, so it's, it's also hidden. You know, as far as consumer protection goes, 100%. And then let's say six months from then, they're like, oh man, my neighbor's been saving money on the program and it's local renewable power. I'd like to get in the program. Simple phone call, go on the internet, sign in, log in and, and opt in. They're back in the program on their next meeting. How long a process is a minimum or maximum for all this to happen? So I can tell you that up until uh, step number seven, I can tell you that over the next month and a half, two months, we can take care of that for you. 100%. Okay, once, to once it gets to the state process, we've had it as low as three months, and we've seen it take as long as 18 months. We just, if you call, you're bothering us, don't bother us, we're the Department of Public Utilities. So you're talking three, so you're talking five to 20 months. I, I would Time's estimate good. a year from here. Pardon? Before you, I'll, I would estimate a year or from year now year. before you're, you're procuring, yeah. But I would say you, you could finish up yours by the end of August or September, and then I agree with Denise, then it really depends upon what we fall into, what the department has in front of them. Okay. How often do you guys guess wrong? On? Your price rate. How often do you guys fall, you lock in a load of, of nine and a half cents? Yes. And all of a sudden, the rates on that same mix consistently are below nine and a half cents? So I would say it happens very inconsistent on, so what we, I'm gonna address two questions here, but so there are summer rates and there's winter rates. Yeah. So 
when I look at a contract, if it's at least tw 12 months long, I'm looking at the average and if there's savings there. I'm not looking at, I'm making savings all, every year. Yeah, but consumers do. Agreed, and that's why I like the plan the way it's written. If they wanna take the savings you know, during the winter time, rates are a little higher. But if you, I'm just going to say, say winter rates are 13 and summer rates are, uh, are, are 10. You sign a contract at 11 cents. In my opinion, you've done, you've stabilized, saved two cents all winter, you gave back a penny all summer. But if the customer is going to watch, tell them when the rate changes. We'll have it on our website. We have a link right there. Have them opt out and then get back in on the next contract. But I can tell you, the one thing I'm going to tell you is, depending on how you're looking, I'm gonna, I have the ability to take a look at the marketplace, what's happening with capacity, what's going on as far as the rec market, all those things that are going to affect your price. I, I, if I could tell you I could save you every single time, we could have this meeting in Aruba. It's a market, right? right. No, but I can tell you, okay, this is fair, and I know where the markets are heading because we can show you that on the, on the curve. Meaning 6, 12, 18, 24, I can show you it's backwardated or it's not backwardated, so forth and so on, it's contango. Those kind of things can be seen. It's one of the things I think is nice is the electricity markets are fairly opaque but this process brings it out to kind of too light, if you will. It's not as opaque as it would seem because we let the market expose itself. So our goal is to bring as many suppliers as we possibly can that are looking to serve aggregated load. Okay. But I just want you to know, I have, I have made decisions that have been upside down for the contract. Can you tell so us? So is my brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna be honest. Can you tell us the other communities you've talked to which have said yes and Anybody said no? Uh, no, no. So still? currently, nobody has said no. But and Denise has been with towns. There's someone that you're speaking in the other Franklin County. Or anywhere in the state, anywhere in the state, but well, mostly Franklin County. Or yeah. yeah, the towns are. I mean, the towns we're talking to are already moving. There's one that just forgot to put it on. Yeah, Shootsbury didn't get it on their warrant, but so they have all the other through. towns right now we've spoken to and they're moving forward that yeah. were a part of this RFP. Okay. So, well, one last quick question. So we go through this process, and what say we? What say we choose a twelve-month time period? What? So in twelve months from now, we're doing that process over again. Is that is that how it works? What's the ongoing commitment from the town? So there shouldn't be any other than at some point during that twelve-month period. I'm going to come back to you. Market looks good. Let's take a look at the marketplace, and then we're going to run that process of his indicative pricing, his final pricing, and that's the commitment of the town. As long as somebody at town hall can forward calls to us at our call center so that we're answering all the calls, so that everyone gets the correct information. Colonial has been answering uni ag questions for 15 years. We do a pretty good job at it. Rather than you needing to do that, all we need you to do is, no problem, please call us never. We've hired this, this company to take care of these calls. Other than that, it really shouldn't take any of your time. So after 12 months, we have to decide again what the rate? That's want. correct. If you did a 12 month term. Yes, term. 24 month term, do whatever. That, that, correct. If you did a six month, you, sometime in the next three or four months, you'd be back in that process. Okay. If you did a 24 month, at some point in there, I'd come back to you and say, hey, look, there's an unbelievable deal for, I'm gonna say 2020, uh, uh, you know, Rex or Energy, I think, I think we should look at the marketplace, show you the pricing, and see what you think. If you wanna get the final pricing, we go do it. If not, no problem. Well, so you're not going to do that mid-contract. You're not going to do that mid-contract. Well, it depends as on we, as we're nearing the end of a current contract. Well, it just depends on the marketplace. If if I see um, 2020, I'm just going to say 2022 futures energy prices tank. I'm going to let you know about it. I'm saying you signed a contract right now, but I can at 10 cents, and I can lock up six and a half cents, I'm not saying I could do this, I'm saying this is a, a hypothetical. I'm gonna call you and say, do you have any interest in, 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 in this scenario? For whatever reason the market has mispriced, this. If you say yes, you'll sign a contract in 2019 for 2021. Right. What if we do nothing, the contract runs out? We just go back to basic service? Seamlessly you go back to basic service. The, the problem is, if you we go like back because of price, now you gotta go back through the process. You don't have to take it. They can't make you go back and take a vote, but the rest of the process needs to be, you gotta go back through the, you know, hang a plan, vote on the plan. 
you know, we, and we've done this with numerous towns, when there are conditions that utilities have that we don't. So in Haverhill and Methuen, they have the ability, National Grid, to subsidize their capacity. And the best price I can get them is have everyone else in basic service subsidize. So go back to basic service. That means they have to go back through the process again, to go back up to the bid. But nothing has to happen. Okay, every time there's a change in price, is the consumer gonna know automatically or? Uh, so we would notify the town. Right. Depending on how you wanted to do that, we could ask. Uh, um, our, our website would be updated. I don't know if you want to put anything on your website or, or, or how you wanted to notify it, if you wanted something to go up to each. But the customer system. would have access to your website. And I mean, then we give you a public notice to post it, a, a hard copy and a little Right, because I, and, and again, it's not really the same, but I have solar in my house. Mm -hmm. And once in a while I like to see, am I having a good day? I agree. And and you go and you and you say, oh I, yeah, I I generated thirty five you know yeah. kilowatts kilowatt hour you know and yes all right good day this is a lousy two week you know whatever it was yes right? so people can, yeah. <laughs> yes. people can do that yeah people can do that one hundred percent all all everything about the program will be there okay okay all right we got to move this along okay so I I don't know that I've heard back from town council on the agreement. The, the template agreement for Quinto Power. So, so we can't vote on that. Well, you can you could make a vote on it conditioned you know conditioned on town council approval. Uh, okay, then I would make a motion to approve this contract. Who's your own? The KP law. Yeah, so that's their contract. <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah, so I just want you to know that that's their contract. Right. He okay. should have stayed. <laughs> well, it might not have been him. That's the right. right. So if the motion's contingent on that, then all right. Motion I'm fine with to it. accept this contract with Colonial Power contingent upon. Council Town Council approval. Roll call. Well, no, there's a second. Oh, sorry. I'm being, form, I'm being formal here. For I heard a second. Time. Roll call. Aye. Joyce? Uh, uh, aye. Fred? Yes. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Yep. All right. We're going to run through this fast. Town Hall project update discussion. Joyce, you feel like sticking around? Yeah, sure. All right. So, so, Joyce, what time is it there? Uh, it is 1.48 a.m. The sun is going to be up in about an hour and a half. I was going to say, yeah. All right. Or, or sooner. She says it goes up at 3. Yeah. Kind of like 3, 3.30, something like that. I'm not usually up for it. But oh, come on. Yeah. You can do it this morning. By 4, it's bright. And, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Town Hall Project yeah. Update. Um, it is continuing. Uh, much of the interior work is focused on the rear stair tower. Um, still doing punch lists for the re remaining building, and uh, the site work is still being uh, site work outside, especially in the rear, is, is um, continuing as well. I don't know, Fred, you want to add anything to that summary? Well, what well, most, guess most, most, most of the work, like Brian was saying, has been done in just minor stuff here and there. Um, I'm guessing a couple more weeks yet. Uh, and I've been coordinating some with, with the Historic Society and the Historic Commission about uh, their plans and for, say, the Fall Festival uh, and their plans for moving into the building. Uh, historic Society is moving in and both of them uh, offices have, have set a date for a fall festival of September 30th. And their desire is to do it at the, at the renovated town hall. And I guess there's also, also been kind of an agreement between them and the building committee that we should do a grand opening celebration in conjunction with that fall festival. That's on a Sunday. I think theirs starts at 11, and we could do a, a grand opening at, at 10 o'clock in the morning before that session. Uh, the building is not, not available today to, for anybody to move in, to set up furniture, or, or even to use it for any, any purpose. So we're still talking two or three months uh, before any of that happens. Well. It may be maybe another month before it can be used, but the Historic Society wants some time to move in and set up their displays uh, before we have any kind of opening ceremony. 
or any, any kind of open house. So. Okay. That's so that's what we're shooting for. Uh, Are we going to mark handicapped in the front at all? There is no handicapped in the front. It's no all on the side. Because we want, we want people to use the uh, stair tower with the lift. Well, other than the first floor, How about it's accessible. The post we haven't changed anything on the post office. Their handicap ramp is still the same. Okay. Parking while parking? No, they would people would park behind the post office, the handicapped, and then just come around to that ramp in the front. It's okay. it's there. So yeah. Okay. Uh, is that it for the building? Yes. Okay. For car contracts. I'm gonna send a bunch of things on your way to sign to expedite this. Is this all A or is there other things here as well? These two first ones are are A. The town uses the, the FERCOG Regional Accounting Program. So one is just the agreement for FY19 and the other one is a uh, agreement that allows us to use the software that they use. Okay. So do we both? Yep. Sorry. Do we vote or do we just sign? Um, Oh, roll, yeah, roll call vote. All right, roll call vote to accept the FERCAR County Program contracts for fiscal year 19. Um, Joyce. Second. Okay, Joyce. And, uh, second and aye. Aye, Fred. Aye. copies of each. Okay, this is just a chair. Right? Yeah. One is just a chair, is that okay? Yeah. Wait, what's this? The, does it say software? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. okay. Shall I go to the Pine Plains? Pine Plains Estates. This is a final process in uh, making the, the streets in Pine Plains Estates um, public ways. This is the towns, are, the towns acquiring a, an easement for that roadway. This was authorized um, at the most recent annual town meeting. Um, motion to accept the deed acceptance and sign. Second. Vote roll call. Joyce. Yes. Fred. Yes. Yes. So four. Next one. Yep. So four. Petty cash calls out. I'm recommended that the select board vote to close out petty cash. Um, it's something that I've had in my office for going on two years now and I have never used it. Um, and there's really no need to have cash hanging around and any expenses that we have, we use our debit slash credit cards that have been issued, so. Um, this is only for your petty cash, not for individual. Our petty cash. Right, not for committee board. petty cash. Correct. Since REC has petty cash because. Correct. You're right, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, motion to close out petty cash count for the select board and administrative offices. Second. I'll second that. Oh. Roll call, Joyce. Yes. Fred. Yes. Yes. Uh, Perfect. Hannum Special Legislation. So Kulik's office um, contacted us and said that this uh, special legislation request to allow John Hannum to continue passing age of 65 is in something called a House Committee on Bills in Third Reading and they suggested that a letter from the select board encouraging them to take action on it would be helpful. Should so I check for letter. grammar or are we good or does the grammar police not have to review? Well I pretty much took what the Kulik letter said and used that, so what they had recommended. Okay. Um, Interesting, page one, you usually don't number a single page no, document, sure just the like same. Is that, that's not grammar though, is it? Uh, it's a little grammar for me. Kind of, uh, but it's, you know, appropriateness and kind of. All right. Um, select board department liaison assignments. Do we want to go over those tonight? Not really. <laughs> I, I don't. Do you guys, I mean. Do we, do we have them written somewhere? Is there? 
Um, I would, you? I, I would hope you guys have a. I'm policing. Jonathan's policing. And highway. Highway. And I'm Fred, your water and. Water and fire. Fire. That would be appropriate. Yeah. Water and fire going and, together. And Joyce. Joyce. What are you? Admin. Office, uh, apparently. Town clerk. What, what was the other one? Town offices? They're usually the chairperson, is that? Yeah. Ta uh, but treasurer collector? There's a treasurer collector one. I haven't read that. It must have been treasurer collector. I remember I was treasurer collector, not during a fun time. Mm-hmm. Who gets to negotiate the third year contract for the, for the town administrator? Well, I do that by myself. Yeah, well, I'm the liaison to administration, so. Okay. Well, they're, of course, an health committee. Uh, yep, yeah, I am a personnel committee. Do we have a liaison for the schools? No, that's... Do I hear volunteer? Yeah, I think that I've gotten in, you know, a bit involved with the new principal search, and I was thinking, you know, I'd like to reach out to the new principal and, um, you know, just to, since I've already met her, um, and just, you know, let her know my, my phone still works even though I'm out of the country for a while, <laughs> and I'll be back before things get really, uh, uh, well, budgety. Um, but if we had a liaison to the schools, I would be happy to take that. I think that's a good idea. And, and Joyce, just so you're, just so you don't get, you know, get think I'm stepping on your turf I I have reached out and I haven't heard back but I plan to reach out again just as a as the chair and, and a, as a parent but I have no interest in being the liaison okay so I would I would um, so but so what does that mean we, we still haven't heard what Joyce's list of assignments are other than her newly appointed school designation Personnel committee. Personnel committee. And I, but I'm sure there's more to it than that. Yeah, but there's more. But this is more liaison to departments. Personnel committee is like, is like Fred sitting on yeah. capital planning. Mm. It's different. So who? It's it's treasurer. Joyce is treasurer collector. Yeah, I know. Last time around, I was I was like fire and something. Fire water. Water, yeah. Well, you know what? I don't think we can discuss this unless we have a full list of who's of, of, of what we're supposed to do. So let's get a full list and then. Yeah. I had listed in the other email, but I don't have that email. All right. Um, okay. Appointment of administrative assistant. Yep. So as we all know, Mary. I move that we appoint. What's that? Well, let's talk about I in public hearing who the person is that we're appointing before we move. Oh. Yes. Okay. Again, because I'm supposed to be formal for some reason all of a sudden. So in your in your packet, well, let me back up a little bit. We all we all know that, or maybe some people don't know that Mary Ellen is leaving. Much um, to our chagrin. Much to our chagrin. And mm -hmm. uh, we posted the position, and we got a good number of of, of resumes, uh, many of them through Indeed.com, um, and a couple were hand delivered, and, and one person filled out. Um, that job application and, and submitted a resume. Um, I asked Mary Ellen to go through them and, and to look over them and to see what who, who she thought were the top candidates for that. Um, Mary Ellen and I interviewed uh, two folks, and um, I, I think we both agree that that Amy Schrader, uh, she's a Whitley resident, um, was probably the most is probably the most is the most qualified candidate um, for the job, and that would be our recommendation. And a resume is included in your uh, in your meeting packet. I would move the well, Joyce. I don't want to steal your thunder. You go ahead. Oh, I I, I read over her resume. I think I like the process she used, so I'm um, I'm happy with that, and I would move to uh, appoint her. And for how how many hours is this, Brian? This is twenty four hours. That's the, 24 that's hour the, position. The current yeah. position is yes. And, and, hours. and what is happening with Janet? Um, we will need to um, the recommendation from from Lynn, and I should I should get that formalized. Is for that Janet would um, move to the assistant treasurer collector, town clerk role. Okay. 
and so it's it's equal number of hours. No hours are changing. No impact on budget. The budget hours remain the same. Budget hours remain the same. Salaries, the hour, hourly salary may change, but budget hours remain the same. Yeah, the salaries were set for the you know when, when we did the the budget in April. Right. So. Okay. All right, Joyce, you can move. And when would this position oh. start? Um, she, she requested that that she be um, so she want to give two weeks notice to her to her current. Two weeks. Okay. So um, uh, hopefully it would be you know it will likely be towards the end of July, but hopefully before Mary Ellen leaves on July thirty first, there'll be a couple of days to overlap. Okay. Okay. Okay, Joyce. Now. Okay, and move that we hire. Uh, this wonderful young woman. Amy Schrader. Amy Schrader. Second. All those in favor, Joyce. Yes. Fred. Yes. Me, yes. All right, um, time minister updates, Brian. Um, Cautionary tale. Just a couple things. Um, I thought it was interesting that well, we, we did uh, finalize the agreement with Stephen Herbert, and you, uh, Jonathan came in and signed that, and I believe he's, if he hasn't already, he's submitting his application to the uh, Cannabis Control Commission. Um, it was interesting, I get, uh, we received a letter from, and it's, I forgot to put it in the packet, we re received a notification from the Department of Agricultural Resources, and under state law, the Department of Agricultural Resources can issue licenses to grow hemp. Um, and we got notification that the that location of Waitley received a, a license to grow hemp. Um, so just wanted to pass that along. From the same license applicant? Nope. No, this is a oh, it's 60, 62 Christian Lane. Um, we received it, so it's a public record. Um, mm -hmm. So. But this is like industrial hemp. But yeah, I had to. Like, I had to educate myself on the difference. You make sweaters out of it or something, right? Between. Uh, rope. Hemp What's and that? Rope. Rope, other types of marijuana plants, but um, I, I'm told they're very similar. Does it fall under the same guidelines for no. growing? No. Or no. 62. What What is the zoning for growing hemp? Um, I believe it's agriculture. It's just agriculture. Yeah. I, I'm told the difference is that it has none or very little THC, so it's treated as a. So it has no medicinal value either. May have I think that's correct. Or something. So that's what? I think it, the medicinal part is the like carbonol or something, not the THC. Right. Okay. So it, it may. So if you see suspicious-looking plants growing, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's growing without. But we do not get to claim three percent or anything like that on this. This is just an agricultural product that has no taxation. Oh, nice try. Well, you know. Always trying to get money. Who is the property owner at Um The applicant name was, was uh, Van Epps. Okay. Van Epps, I don't know. Um, 62 Christian Lane. I don't know, what number are you? I'm 154. It's got to be before State Road on that side. Is that the old oh, roofs? The, no, it's across the street from the roofs. Got to be. I, mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Well, well, you're 154. Well, Sawinski was what? 59. What 59, was he? Yeah. yeah. So it's on. It's it's oh, it's right. it's across the roofs. There's a small plot of land there. Yeah, I know where it is. Anyway. Okay. It's a material. Okay. All right. Is that it? And then uh, <laughs> one last thing: the Wimsburg Road Bridge. We finally got a really close to final engineering. Oh no, kidding! Great. Uh, uh, that the cost is probably going. It's looking like it's going to be a little over um, the four uh, four hundred ninety nine thousand dollars that we have. But Keith thinks that we can cover it with with the Chapter ninety funds that that we'll have available. So okay, um, that should keep moving forward. And still this summer or this fall? Which um, year? Let me rephrase. I'd have to, I'd have to defer to Keith on that. Okay, okay keep us posted on that. Yeah, and as we mentioned before, the, the reason Keith had to, the reason we allowed Keith to go forward was that they were doing a, a, a post-incident meeting about the, the crash on 91, so. Right. Let's be sure we keep property owners who will be impacted by the 
pending opening of that when it's finally done aware that this is moving forward yes okay motion to adjourn oh, oh, one second. oh god what <laughs> executive session executive session seriously yeah but before you do that did uh, have we heard from our retail marijuana people at all you want 424 state road or whatever which ones the ones that the retail they were, they were supposed to schedule a uh, oh and the ones that canceled the meeting yeah, yeah. um i my understanding uh, from talking with them is that is that they don't have a location secured they're looking at different options i think yeah oh I they no longer have the sugar loaf shops. Is that what you're saying? Uh, they don't have site control. Um, but they told us they did. Obviously, it's changed. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but okay. that's that's what I heard. All right. All right. Close the meeting. Uh, close the meeting. Uh, we will not re-enter open meeting, and we will be closing this meeting to go into executive session. Second motion. Roll yep. call vote. It's per MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A6, to consider the sale or purchase of real estate located at 219 Christian Lane, because the chair believes they have a detrimental effect on our negotiating position. Thank you. Right? Yes. Roll call vote, yes. Joyce? Yes. Fred? Yes. Yes. 